Yeah, I was thinking if Lizzie is
Um, let's get started with our second session. So uh, Phoebe Jewell and Marjorie Richards will be talking to us a little bit about Cu gender and sexuality in Cuba. And the title is Cuba Libre, Gender and Sexuality in Cuba. So let's give them a hand. So um, there were a couple of questions after that first session about um, uh, the difficulty because of the embargo and a, a, a little bit about the traveling. How do you travel um, to Cuba as an American citizen? Um, and there, there have been many ways that people have done it illegally, right? Going to, because as John pointed out, the, the, the close proximity of Mexico um, to, to Cuba, a lot of people have gone via Mexico, um, um, Canada. Canada, because Canada has normal uh, trade relations and diplomatic relations. And many of my Canadian friends, when I told them I was going to Cuba, they were like, oh yeah, I went a lot in the 80s. You know, they're like, what? <laughs> um, but just to give you a sense of what it was, the process was like for Marjorie and me and the other delegates who went with a group of other delegates, um, we had to apply. Um, not only did we have to have a passport, but we had to send, we had a Sure. We, we, write write a paper. we had to write a paper about what we were going to do and what we we're going to, you know, how we were going to take what we had learned. We had to prove that we were worthy of going to Cuba, basically. Right? This was sent to the charter agency that was running the, the tour. Right? And, um, and we were working with a group um, called U.S. Women in Cuba Collaboration um, that's been around for 16, 17 years. Um, that is, and we'll talk a little bit more about what its goals are, but they helped us with this process. Um, we had to um, submit our resumes um, because we were an actress. Up to now, um, you have to be um, an academic, you have to be doing some kind, of, uh, some kind of research, or maybe even there's religious affiliations, right? There was a group, there, there, I remember that was one of the boxes you had to, you could be right. part of a religious group. Um, so it's very restricted who gets to go. Um, it's not like you get to go and then go lie on the beach and then go drink mojitos and then listen to some music and, and then, you know, it's, no. Because in fact, they, we submitted our resumes, but many of us got our applications booted back out and we had to write an academic paper that demonstrated the connection between what we were actually going to be doing in Cuba with what it said on our resume and our job description. So we couldn't just say, oh yeah, I'm studying in my field. We actually had to demonstrate. And we had to have our CVs, our resumes with us the whole time we were in Cuba. Um, I remember we first got to Havana, they said, keep it in the very first thing, and it's a pretty nice hotel. And they had safes in it and everything. Stick your, make sure your resume's there, and all your travel documents are there. So you can know, and when you're traveling, you always have them on you to show that you, it's not enough to have a passport, mm. especially with a US passport. What? So that was required. Yeah, who required it? Yeah, it sounds um, like they're requiring it. So my understanding is that the, the requirement in the beginning of us having the paper and everything mm -hmm. to show the alignment was the U.S. government. And the, yes. the travel agency was trying to get all their ducks in a row in case they were questioned about the legitimacy of the trip. They had to be able to demonstrate that, in fact, we were on this academic research trip that was aligned with what we said we were. Um, it, they could be fined and it would jeopardize their commercial yes. license if they got in trouble for that and their reputation. But there also had been an event that had happened in Cuba right before that you may have read about in the news. USAID had sent in a group of students pretending to be, people pretending to be starting a, what was that, music? A rap music festival. And it turned out that it was actually um, USAID was funding these people to go in and help basically um, help youth um, to see to sow the seeds of dissent, dissent, yeah. dissent and the, uh, it, because you know because of the 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 effects of the embargo I mean, life is hard as John was talking about so there are there are people we've met people who were and they believe in this in the socialist ideals and the revolution but they're also dealing with the fact that things are, are really really hard so there I mean there is and so a lot of Cubans that we talked to are really struggling with how to maintain the goal of the, the goals of the of this of of the revolution and a socialist egalitarian society, but also live, you know, comfortably. So I mean, the equivalent would so, be is if yeah. somebody had funded students to come into the United States and then went to some universities and said, hey, you're unhappy with Obama, right? So let's plot to overthrow yeah. the president. 
and that's what they were doing. And so they, Cuba then is very sensitive to people coming into Cuba saying, well, wait a minute, are you really doing what you're saying? And, and also, just because the U.S. at this time, at that time, this was in the summer when we were doing, in the spring and the summer when we were doing all of our paperwork, because we went in September, um, when we got our visas, um, it was from a special Swiss consulate, the Cuban, the Cuban consulate in Vienna. Yeah, because there's no, there's no U.S. Cuban you know, exchange at that time, so it, it came. The stamp was from the U.S. sort of the Cuban interest through it via the. Swiss consulate in, the, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. That's how complicated it is. It's silly. So you said that Canadians had been going to Cuba, but they also have an embargo? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. So why why couldn't um, Cuba prosper through Canadian? There's limitations, and I maybe John could speak to this, or Marjorie could well, some about of, Some of it is it's if, if any product has more than 30% U.S. made parts, they are not allowed to sell that mm -hmm. to Cuba. So it's not just trading with the United States. And so the U.S., obviously, we have a lot of people buy stuff from us. A lot of products in Canada are made in the U.S. So that that's what the, I think that connected back to that a lot of their economy is based on U.S. machinery and their replacement parts are made here. Yeah, and I think I've heard, and maybe John knows, but uh, I believe that um, shipping companies, if they have stopped at a Cuban port, are right. not allowed to stop at a U.S. Yes. port. Mm -hmm. For six months. For six months. Yeah. Thanks. So there's lots of ways around that. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go. You go. <laughs> We're still on the we have lives. We have not rehearsed this. Sorry, guys. Okay. So this is just a, a little bit about the U.S. Women in Cuba collaboration that um, Cindy um, Domingo and Jan Stroud <coughs> last night at the Columbia City Gallery um, started in the, I believe it was in the mid-90s. And because uh, Cindy had gone to Cuba and was um, amazed at the, the advances for women, especially in Cuba, because of the revolution. And so she wanted to... Um, be a voice, uh, she, she feels very strongly at people-to-people -people exchanges, so she's been leading delegations mainly of women to Cuba for like 16 years. Um, and um, there are other goals of this organization. One was to free the Cuban Five, so also to the end the embargo, and to lift the travel ban. Um, sort of the three big things. So if you want to um, know more, yeah, there's their, and they do have regular trips down there. If you're interested, they have one coming up in May. They have one coming up in May, and it's actually co-ed. And they, uh, what they usually do is have a different theme each year, each trip, um, because especially as they go and de uh, develop more relationships with different uh, organizations in Cuba, um, and, and they start to have, again, this human-to-human -human contacts, um, then there's more room for them to explore um, other, uh, other ways to understand the, the um, Cuban experience, Cuban realities, and for Cubans to learn, to learn about um, the U.S. as well. So um, the year before we went, we <coughs> about sustainability. So the people who went um, went to farms, they talked about what, what Cuba is doing um, in terms of the, sort of a, a green economy. Um, the year this our trip um, was looking at the economic impacts of, of the embargo and the, some of the some of the economic reforms on women and children. Um, and also to, because of uh, previous trips, uh, connection with um, um, several different lesbian groups to look at um, the status of lesbians and gay people in general in Cuba, um, which has not always been really great and actually really bad, but things have changed drastically in the last 10, 15 years. And we'll talk more about that. So here's our delegation. <coughs> oh, I guess they can. You want it? So here we are. Yeah, yeah. Here we are. You might recognize Tracy. Tracy. Tracy Live teaches history. <laughs> University of Washington. University of Washington. San Diego, North Seattle. Um, Nevergreen. Nevergreen. She here for a while. Yes, yeah. that's Angela. Yeah. And um, also Tracy. Uh, Tracy Live's daughter Nisa. Um, was there? She's she was a photographer. Uh, she's a photographer. She's an amazing photographer. So here's another map of 
Cuba, and so we flew in from Havana, uh, we flew in from Miami to Havana, spent about three days in Havana, then went to Santa Clara, um, spent two days, three days. Santa Clara is very important to Cuba because it's the city of Che. Che is one of the great revolutionaries of the, of the Cuban Revolution. Um, he's not a Cuban. Right? He was born in Argentina. If any of you have seen Motorcycle Diaries, maybe you can get a sense of that. However, um, he was killed in Bolivia. Bolivia. Um, his ashes um, were found and are now interned in this um, memorial to, to Che um, in Santa Clara. Um, and we were there. There we also, this is where we um, met with um, a group groups of lesbian groups from around Cuba, um, people from as far, as far away as Santiago de Cuba, who had traveled, traveled that day, like the day before, yeah, and just specifically for this conference. And so many of them had come on the bus. Yes, bus from exactly. And let me tell you, <coughs> traveling by bus <laughs> in the back roads and the main roads of Cuba can be quite bumpy. Um, and let's see where I'm going. Trinidad's not on there. Trinidad's not on here, but it's about, what's it more this? Yeah. Uh, Trinidad de Cuba is a world heritage site. We'll show a couple of slides. Mm -hmm. um, it's a 500-year-old colonial city, um, deep in the heart of the sugar plantations. Um, we learned a lot about the slave trade while we were there. Um, it's also um, a city that's being really opened up to tourism um, and um, art and well, yeah, and, and I don't know if you talked about this, but the um, history of Cuba and the slave trade is very similar. It's very close to the southern part of the United States. And so it's very similar, and a lot of the architecture is similar, but you can see that same influence of this vast amount of wealth that was gotten you know, on the backs of other people. And um, they, so, so that's an it's sort of, a, in some ways, a snapshot of what our American South used to look like, this giant, mm -hmm. massive. Mm -hmm buildings and yeah. the kind of history. And there's a tower that was um, here in the old plantation. We'll get there later. Um, and then we went to uh, San Fuegos. Um, excuse me. Um, and we were there for a couple of days and met yeah, with an amazing group of people, which we'll tell you more about. And then we were back in that. All right. The Federation de Mujeres is the net, it's a government organization. Or is it an NGO? It's a government organization, it's actually. Government. Um, and it is, they specifically work with the conditions of women in Cuba, from everything from health care to child care to all. Um, imagine if we had a branch of the government that was dedicated solely to the condition of <laughs> And it's real, too. It's not just like window dressing. Everywhere we went, with, where there was a small little community group in a neighborhood in, in Havana, or in Trinidad with a, in an artist to talk about the FMC, that the FMC has done so much for women. Um, and, and also, when we, we, most of the places we went to, the directors um, were women. I mean, it was this, the, the, the representation of women in positions of power was incredible. Yeah, and part of that is education is subsidized, so education is free. And so you have a lot of women who have PhDs and master's degrees, and just like here. <laughs> so there's there. Um, yeah. And here we are. Meeting so they met with us, got gave us coffee and food, and we tried to stay awake. <laughs> Cuban coffee, so we don't like sugar, but man, I love it. So um, one of the things that Cuba has, which I think is pretty amazing, is they have a center, it's a, it's the National Center for Sex Education, um, and it's been around since the 90s, I believe, maybe the 80s, I can't remember, I should have read my notes from the trip, um, but the woman who is the director is actually the daughter of Raul Castro, who is the uh, president of Cuba, so she's the niece of Fidel Castro, and she, um, it's a submission to um, not only, um, it's more, it's sex education in, in, in so many ways. It's more than this is how you use a condom or you know that kind of thing, as it is a, about um, sexual diversity. So she has really in, um, started this campaign, um, an anti-homophobia campaign, 
um, and really working hard to advance um, the status, status of gay people um, and trans people in, in Cuba. Um, in Cuba, when they have um, a, a Pride Day, it's not in June like in the United States. It's in the States, it's in June to commemorate the Stonewall riots. Um, in Cuba, it's in May, I believe, because May is the month when the, uh, di the diagnostic standard DSB, yes, the DSM, the DSM, the psychological <laughs> thing, yeah. the, the, was that was the month, the month it was in May of 19, there's no this. Um, yeah, that, that, that homosexuality was removed as a disorder, and so that is what the day that in Cuba, they commemorate, they support gay people. And it's an anti-homophobia as opposed to a gay pride to be inclusive for everyone. It's everyone's sort of um, yes. responsibility could, to celebrate Could you remind that. us what year that was? I don't remember. I mean, it seems like it was so close. I thought it was 87. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh, somebody's Googling it. We don't have time right now. This is just, look it up while we keep talking. This is a current <laughs> advertising campaign they have right now. We came home with some of these posters. Yeah. Again, can you imagine if we had a branch of the government that was dedicated primarily to sex education, any kind of sex education, and then sexuality and sexual health in general. Yes. Um, transgender surgery is covered by their universal health care yeah. in Cuba. And we met the first um, yes. female to male transgender surgery person when we were down there at an event. And it's in a beautiful old building on Senesex. There's a courtyard where you walk in where they have all these posters, and yet they also have um, amazing statues of different parts of male and female bodies. So it's, again, the sense of this is a normal, natural thing. That's sexuality. It's, it's good. It's part of life. Um, Barbara, 1986. 1986. That was a year off, which is really not that. Oh, recently. <laughs> <laughs> so these are some of the posters, not only of, yeah, of, the, of the, um, the campaign, but also just of the anti-homophobia day. Oh, actually, I don't know if you got this email that I, we got right before yeah. that they're going to have. Um, so we just got an email from somebody that, from Senesex who said that the, um, they're going to have their first <coughs> convention with Congress. Um, I can't actually tell. They're just saying it's the, the whole, all of Senesex. If it's about um, uh, gay and lesbian or GLBTQ stuff or if it is just about sexuality in gen general, that it's going to be this first um, convocation with Congress that's going to happen in September. So, so uh, we want to do Should we go keep going in order? Yeah. yeah well, I'm just thinking maybe skip through this because we're now at 125 and we want to focus on gender and sexuality. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. This, this, this was just an, an art, uh, a local mm -hmm. art. Um, community art center that we visited and that they greeted us with this dance in the street. We actually <laughs> thought it was just a random street dance happening and then it turned out they were doing it for us and they gave us each a sunflower. Mm -hmm. But one of the things about this art gal this art center is that, like, and this is something that I, I think is really kind of common in Cuba, is it's not like, okay, we're just painting art. It's a place to gather and talk about the, the art as a means to um, understand the, the legacies of colonialism, so they talk a lot about racism and um, also gender and race together, so there was a place where they really talked about intersections of, of those isms, um, and this is some of the art. So this is a representation of Cuban music. Um, we visited the Literacy Museum, they had a huge literacy campaign which was won all kinds of international awards and raised their literacy rate from something like something to 80%, yeah. like from 10% to 80%. So again, look it up on Google. If <laughs> statistics, that's not our Wait, focus, I have it over here. It is one of the things that, that here, was- 60 to 76%. It was one of the, the primary um, goals after the revolution was to raise literacy because they believed that an educated people are you know, empowered. So again, you know, if you compare it to our literacy rates in this country, it's Many of the people um, John spoke about is the call to the youth. Um, many of the people, um, a, a huge number of people who went were young women. So I think, and really in the sense of the transforming the lives. Our guide Tatiana, her mother was, had been one of 
uh, the, the Brigadistas, and she, she came back as a young woman thinking about sort of re-examining her ideas about gender and gender roles and, and, and all of that. So they taught people of all ages how to read. The, um, who sent the lanterns? China. China sent the lanterns because they were out in the countryside where there was no electricity. I traveled to Nicaragua when I was in college as my study tour, and Nicaragua modeled their literacy campaign on the Cuban literacy campaign, and they had photographs of their literacy campaign. <coughs> um, another art um, center that we visited, um, heard some music, people who had, could sell their crafts. It was a local neighborhood um, artist center and educational center sort of, you know, like the experimental college at the University of Washington, but much more local. Um, this was the tower that um, Phoebe referred to on, in Trinidad on one of the former plantations where the um, plantation owners would watch their, make sure their slaves were not escaping from this. So, question in the earlier session, in John's session, about uh, medicine and the level of education. And um, here's an example of uh, the ways in which Cuba really responds to, um, to the needs of the people. So um, throughout Cuba, there are different maternity um, houses, in a sense, often for women who are having um, some difficulty with their, their um, pregnancy if they're out in a rural area. And um, with, um, so they, they come in and they're taken care of and they also get classes and training and, and whatnot. And here are some of the doctors and nurses and the guy, the, the guy in the far right, he's just had just come back from spending two years, I think, in uh, Venezuela. Mm -hmm. So again, this is another example of the humans um, taking care of their own in a sense, but also working outward. That's what it looks like. Uh, we visited a factory. One of the things that we learned, I learned later actually about this factory is one of the um, things about Cuba being under the embargo is they have to be very resourceful yes. and fix their own things. Mm -hmm. And so this factory actually built replacement parts for all kinds of things like uh, coffee makers and um, typewriters. Typewriter. I mean, every sort of little thing. But they had this great wooden conveyor belt, which I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. I used to be a carpenter. And they make plastic bottles and um, anyway, again, it was just this really like demonstration of that kind of resourcefulness. Re um, replacement parts for your refrigerator, the seal around your refrigerator door and that kind of thing that where, you know, here we throw things away. They didn't have the luxury of doing that, which of course now makes really good sustainable sense. So in some ways that's a really good model. So, El Mejunje is a um, community gathering place. It's a, it's a performance space, it's a restaurant, it's a bar. It's in Santa Clara and it was around for about 20 years. And if you Google El Mejunje, one of the first hits you'll see is something that'll say, Gay Oasis <laughs> in Cuba. And it's that and it's more than that. I mean, it's all, it's, it's, it's so, many, so many things, but it was set as a, it's a place for Bohemians, gay people, artists, um, sort of social misfits, if you will. Um, this is what the, the man, the founder of it, wanted. He wanted to have a place for people to go where they could come and meet and gather and, and talk about issues that, that are important to them and that also do performances. Um, and um, this is where we had our meeting with the different lesbian groups from around Cuba. Um, but first, we had. Well, it was part of a uh, larger, it was the first um, meeting as part of a larger sort of convention that they're working toward. Um, and it was a put in, uh, I think they started planning it two years ago. This was the first time they were actually able to bring delegates from all over the country. They had to raise money here um, in order to get money to them there to travel. Um, the idea was to start to support specifically women, lesbians, bisexual, transgender, um, because that in, um, in a country that still has a lot of machismo, um, women are still very disempowered, and so they often get left out of that. 
not unlike here. Um, but the idea was to have this gathering and build a co build, build a movement in Cuba and a connection between lesbians, bisexuals in the United States and Cuba, both so that we can learn from them and they can learn from us. So this um, gathering was for us to meet each other and sort of see what that was like and then figure out what our next steps would be. So uh, we arrived, we actually had had a four hour bus ride, which felt very long at the time because it was very hot and humid. And if you've lived here, as long as I've lived here, you're not used to hot and humid like that. Um, but a lot of the women who came had come from much farther away. Um, we, had, um, we had to buy water everywhere we went. And so we were always sort of rationing or watching our water, I think dehydration, we were all getting a little um, tired and worn down. So we showed up at this meeting and sort of, you know, tired and ready to eat lunch. I think it was around noon. And they were really excited to have us there. And they wanted to sit down and have this huge <laughs> meeting virtually. It was like two hours of um, introductions and them telling us about what they were doing and how exciting it was. And then we could talk some more. <laughs> So that was the beginning. The next um, step is they're going to be having some speakers on tour. There's a woman coming, I think, next year. Um, and then they're going to, they're trying to keep it sort of um, uh, organic. So looking at, rather than us deciding or the uh, Cuban Women's Collaboration deciding this is what we're going to do, really trying to be um, responsive and have it be this partnership and organic process of what would they like from us and what would that look like as we Yeah, for instance, when we were talking, we had prepared a, a kind of a, a history of gay rights and les lesbian struggle in the United States and some personal, we were going to do some personal um, testi testimonials in a sense. Um, and we, meanwhile, they kept getting up, a lot of people were getting up and were a little bit restless um, and then would disappear, and then you know, we weren't sure what was going on. And it turns out what was the most, you know, for us, we were all kind of more sort of um, um, intellectualizing it, is that they really wanted to, to share who they were in their own way, um, which was to put on a drag show. So it was a drag king show. Drag king show. Oh. So we had um, Bruno Mars, we had the Backstreet Boys, <laughs> and the dog. The dog. <laughs> <laughs> the dog kept coming and sitting down, looking up at its owner, and we kept thinking that was so funny, and they were just so used, like, like you know. Like, and there were children, and, and as, as um, the day went on, school kids came, were the yeah. children of some of the, the, the people that we were, we were meeting with, so. I wanted to get to the drag king show, but. Um, so it was a meeting that went on and on, for a very long time, it was, um, it was, I think, really powerful. And as we got to the end and they had their um, drag king show, a really it, like dawning on us, like how powerful it was to be in this place where, in some ways, um, in some ways, Cuba is so much more advanced than we are. Mm -hmm. If you think about like their healthcare and their education and all of that, and. Um, but their gay community, because there has been more oppression for longer, I think, for them, um, they're just sort of coming to the place that I feel like we were maybe in the 90s. And so there was this sense of like, this is the place that they got to come and be out. Yeah. A, a lot of these women in the drag show had, came from really small towns in really rural Cuba. And you could tell they never got to do that in their town. There wasn't a place to do it. And it's so easy to forget what that feels like. Because I was having that moment of like, oh God, okay, is this over yet? And then I would think, oh my God, this is amazing. This is amazing. And it felt like such a gift to be there. I, you know, and I have a sense from, I speak very limited Spanish and even more limited when I was there. But a mm -hmm. uh, little bit of a conversation that I had with this young woman who's from Granma, which is um, pretty far south by um, Santiago de Cuba. Um, that, um, that it was really hard for her to organize any kind of show um, in or any kind of meeting in her little town. Um, you know, whereas I think people in Havana and some of the bigger cities, it's a little bit easier. That it's harder for her to get permits, that kind of thing. So it's like it was still that sense of 
Yes, there's this national campaign coming from Senesex, but it's still working its way down. It's social change, and social change always takes quite a bit of time. If two of the people, one of the people that we met who, I don't know where it is in here, but um, is from Cienfuegos, which was the other town yeah. city that we visited, which is a fairly large and fairly wealthy economically yes. um, speaking city, um, both had lost their jobs. They were partners, and um, because they had, they basically were let go because they were lesbians, and so they had no recourse because there was no legal system by which they could challenge them. They are, however, in the process of doing that, and I, they both, because they, it's a socialist system, get um, supported, you know, like our unemployment, like they're both economically supported at a lower level than really what they need to live, but they are able to, orga they're organizing and they are regularly going to Havana and doing some organizing around, working on changing that, just like we are here, right? Because the same thing happens here in places also. And so they're, what is exciting to me is that they are able to work through their system to bring that about. And one of them writes to me on a regular basis, sort of updating me on that mm -hmm. process. And then just as a side note, one of the um, musical traditions in Cuba is called um, oh, God, oh, um, oh, Travo. Uh, uh, and it's where they, it's sort of like a, it's sort of like an open mic with like, you know, Santana and like, um, the, like really amazing musicians. <laughs> and they take turns stepping in and they play, you know, Cuban song, they play blues, they play rap, they play hip hop, you know, and somebody else will step up and play and they they just blow you away. And so that happened at El Mahunje was one of the gathering places for that event. And we had the opportunity to go. I had no idea what I was going to. Somebody just said, do you want to go listen to some music? And I'm like, I'm in Cuba. Of course I want to go listen to music. And I went, and it was packed wall to wall with mostly young people, but people of all ages, people of all gender orientations. Um, people were sitting out with their bottle of rum drinking, and, and then just this astounding music. So the building is, has seen a lot of hard work to see. So we'll try to go through that. Those were where all the people were from and the names of their different groups. Ezel in the middle is the one who's coming on a speaking tour. And that's, that's yeah. I don't know a lot about uh, the Cuban Revolution, but I remember reading that around about 1970, there was a program uh, started where homosexuals were being put in camps and yes. corrected. How did the swing to the extremely progressive position of Senesex happen? That's a really great question. I think, um, oh gosh. Um, and to me, this little reading I've done is there's like a fair amount of silence about it. I don't, I never get the sense that I get that question answered, but I think Castro, Fidel, changed his perspective on it. Um, I think a lot of it was Vilma's, I think Vilma uh, had a lot more than that. I think that she, um, who was, she's um, Raul um, Castro's wife, and was part of the revolution. And the head of the FMC. And the head of the founder of the FMC. And, and actually, Senesex came out of the FMC, so it was the women really who said. But I think, but also, I think a lot of that too was, especially in the 1970s, a lot of that came from some of Che's ideas about the new man, right? And that was this idea of a man who would be someone who would reproduce in so many, or be productive in so many different ways, whether it's in the factory or reproducing children. Um, and so, um, mainly gay men were the ones that were targeted, and as is the case with many other situations, lesbians are pretty invisible. Um, women's sexuality is pretty invisible in, 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 in many ways. Um, there was a very famous film that came out, in, a Cuban film that came out in the 90s, and a number of people mentioned it when we were at Senesex. Um, some of you may have seen it, it's called Strawberry and Chocolate. Yes, it's, yes. it's great. It's, a, it's the story of a, a friendship, a love, a love ship, not oh, yeah. a love relationship, but a, a, a you know the you know, compañeros 
of um, a, a gay man who is an artist, lives in Havana, um, and a young man who's a believer in the revolution and is sort of appalled by this man's his homosexuality and his he puts aesthetics about, about everything and it's about how they learn from each other. And it's sort of this opening up. And I think too, um, what I understand about what is called the special period in Cuba, the late 80s, early 90s, after the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall and then the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, it was a very terrible time economically for Cubans um, because the main support, the main economic support had gone, right? Um, and there was a period, I think, that my sense is, and I could be wrong, is that a lot of the people that we talked to, especially people who've been going to Cuba, non-Cubans who've been going to Cuba for 10, 15 years, so that it feels like there's a change in the, in the atmosphere. People are talking more openly now. It's almost like they're saying, okay, the revolution is 50 years old. How have we lived up to the ideals of the revolution? Where have we failed? People are actually openly talking about racism, homophobia, and sexism. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, be like, they'd say, oh, there's no such thing there. And I don't know if the special period had something to do with that. Maybe that sense of really coming, getting bottom and then coming Oh, John. Yeah, let me just add a little bit to that. Um, there was a time, especially in the early years of the revolution, when people felt the need to, for unity in face of aggression from outside. Yes. So a lot of these social questions were really deliberately just buried, mm -hmm. and it took a long time to resurrect them. Also, there were other attitudes that were coming in from other places, like the Soviet Union yes. and Russia, regarding social issues that were more mechanical and, and harsh. and yeah, those were being implemented also yeah. at times in Cuba, but uh, coming out of uh, coming coming out of the mid '80s, out of the Angola experience, uh, it's just a, a new generation came in, just matured and came into society, and they had more questions, so it just it just flowered. I think that one of the factors. I'm Cuban, by the way. I'm, yeah, I'm from Havana, and one of the factors that have definitely influenced the society, the Cuban society to be more open and acceptance of people from different um, sexual orientations is a lot of tourism. We have a lot of Europeans coming yes. in the country all the time. Yeah. And yes. we look up to them. You know? yeah. Yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah. I'd like to just uh, make a re brief reflection on the uh, um, literacy issue. Yes. Uh, when you were talking about that, what came to my mind was a couple of countries that I've become really read about in recent years. So uh, Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge period, and um, and now I just forgot the other country. But anyhow, there was another country uh, where there was um, supposedly you know revolution and that turned out to be just you know, straight on dictatorship. But um, they, <coughs> well, even in China during the the Cultural Revolution. That's not the other country I was trying to think of, um, where they um, wanted to throw off oppression, they wanted equality for people and all that. And what they did was, in the process, they killed the intellectuals. Mm -hmm. They wanted people to be uneducated because they wanted control. Mm -hmm. My my take on it is they wanted absolute control over the populace so they could re-educate mm -hmm. them the way they wanted to. And that's not to say that nothing good came out of any of these movements, but um, it's so different from. You know, the, I, I, I think the, the Cuban uh, method was so, it was admirable. I mean, you want an educated population. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's one of the reasons, so that's what Nicaragua modeled their revolution after Cuba, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons, right, why we find the United States finds those revolutions threatening is because an educated populace mm -hmm. is threatening. Too. And the populace, when you have, when you have governmental or community um, uh, bodies that are actually going out and asking, well, what do you want? Mm -hmm. What does the community want? What are your needs? Right? And starting there rather than necessarily always imposing. So much more sort of horizontal grassroots um, is what I see. I think also, just to address what you were saying, I was thinking that it, what I kept experiencing was how similar Cuba was to the United States. And I think of the influences on Cuba being very similar to the influences on the United States historically. Um, that we, our, the change here happened also, I think, because the, uh, the rest of the world was more liberal in many ways about sexuality than the United States. And that we, you know, that same thing, of like we're breathing, I think that um, things are changing. Yes. Um, 
my question is, can you speak to the change in relations between the United States and Cuba and what you think, how you think the effects wow. that will affect <laughs> life there and, and what's going to change first? We can bring rum and cigars. <laughs> that's pretty much, as far as I understand, that's the only significant change that is actually, except, I mean, the release of the Cuban, the remainder of the Cuban five, right? And then nothing else. Uh, maybe the, <laughs> some the trade doing here. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you could speak to that. What do you think will change? Uh, in, in Cuba? I was, I'm sorry, I couldn't listen to What do you question. think might change now that relations have changed between the United States? In Cuba. Economy, of course, that's the, the main change that I think is going to happen. Uh, I heard that Obama was thinking of lifting the embargo. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. I hope that it will, otherwise there's no point in having this relationship. But the economy, definitely. And the exchange between American tourists and bringing you know, their own perspective on the thing. Like, we're still on the terrorist list and I don't think we deserve that place. And having the opportunity to see from each other's perspective um, will kind of like, uh, I think in American society is really uneducated on what Cuba is. That's why I really appreciate this talk. So it will bring like knowledge, mainly. When, when the, one of the first days we were there, the, our, we had this uh, guy who was, we, she was only there for one day and she talked a lot, remember this? Um, maybe I was, uh, anyway, she was talking a lot about how um, there's been so much influence uh, in investment from other countries. Europe, South Korea is doing a lot. I know the Netherlands, like the hotel we were staying in, had been was this joint venture between um, a Dutch company and the Cuban government. Um, and she was talking about what's one of the, the challenges for Cuba right now, as things are opening up economically in, in pockets here and there, how to maintain, to hold on to the principles and the values of the revolution without getting sort of subsumed by, you know, capitalism and all of that. So it is, um, and yeah, that, yeah, it's the same kind of there's need for economic opportunity. Well, thank you guys very yeah. much. She needed a visa. Well, she probably had to go through Mexico. You can if you go 
Well, I don't know. She's from Somalia, so I don't know if oh, her Somali passport that she went maybe. through. I even asked her. She was like, "Yeah, since everything is fine." I was like, it "Seems to me it's maybe soon. she's just crazy." I don't know. <laughs> maybe yeah. I was that she didn't tell me everything about it. I was like, "Ah, oh, weird." Such an essential key in sexual education, social, um, yeah, sexual education. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I, the first time I had sex, I knew everything about sex in my body because I've been reading her books ever since I'm like 12 years old. That's great. Like, we, we get those books at school. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Oh my yes. <laughs> and we're learning about algebra, but we don't learn about our own body. Yeah, beauty is such a taboo. Yeah. So, where did you learn English? Cuba. Most of my friends speak fluent English. Do they? Yeah. Young, younger generations are more. Have been sort of international. Yeah. 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 Nice. Well, tell me your name. Lisi. Lisi. Yes. Marjorie. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah, great talk. Thank you. It. So come by um, my office sometime if you want. Oh, perfect. I would love to. Um, actually, I would love to practice my Spanish, but. Perfect. Hi, love. I'm Lisi. Lisi? Yeah. I'm Phoebe. That's Phoebe? great. Oh, like friends. Phoebe. Like that? That's yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> I call you Phoebe so, sometimes. I know. People do that because of that show. Sorry. I'm always like, ah. That's okay. I'm used to it now. I don't really like it, but yeah. I'm used oh, to it. Really? I can deal with it. That was my favorite character. I think I'm so Everybody likes Phoebe. I know. Yeah. Phoebe. It's just crazy. But I do know that um, collaboration is going back down in May. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. I, that, that's just going to be amazing. I'm just so happy for both parties. You know? Yeah. Yeah, we loved it. We, yeah, we fell in love with Cuba already. You know, yeah. somebody said, I think it was Elisette, said that Cuba made her want to be a better person. Really? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that's such a compliment. We were also sad when we got on the plane to fly back to Miami. We were like, can we turn this plane around? Oh, how long did you guys stay? Eight days. It's not very long at all. Oh, yeah. Not long. Yeah. yeah. But you guys have visited well, you know, more, more places than I ever did in 19 <laughs> years. <laughs> Are you going to go back? Uh, to visit eventually, but I'm not planning to go back to live there. Yeah. Yeah. Is your family there? Yeah, my mom's there. Yeah. And yeah, my whole family, except for my father. I'm here with my father. Like okay. Yeah. Well, guys, nice to meet yeah. you. Have a great day. Thanks, yeah. you too. Oh, what's your office, by the way? Yeah, let me get my card. Yeah. I don't remember my number. So. Okay. Very nice, very nice. I'm glad you came. Oh, thank you so much.